has been a media technologist since the 1970s. <laughs> <laughs> I know that term was uh, made back then, but okay. Um, where he has done almost any job that um, you can think of that is loosely falls in the um, environment of media, from acting to voiceovers to stage and lighting to sound and special um, projection effects, photography, audio, video, TV, digital, and even PowerPoint production. Yeah. And he's taught on all these um, topics also. Uh, he is currently the senior media technical specialist at um, North Eastern University, where he designs high and low tech classrooms. He has been a member of CCUMC since the 90s um, and has attended many conferences. He has often presented on topics uh, such as how not to build a new classroom building, uh, successful security measures, control systems, and the roles of the media professional in restructuring higher education. Uh, in addition, he contributes to the leader on articles entitled The Myth of Convergence, uh, and he has served as chair of the Campus Services Interest Group and is currently on the board of the institutional representative. Um, and he is working on the publication group for categorizing and presenting photographs from past conferences. So he knows where all the bodies are. <laughs> okay, so please help me welcome Bruce Ritchie, easing into digital. Thank you, thank you. Okay. What Mark has given us is the perfect basis uh, for what I'm about to, to share with you, which is through no fault of ours, okay? <laughs> it just happened to work out this way. Easing individual. Um, you notice I say the future, the past, and today, because that's really what we're talking about here. We're not talking about um, a stable media. We are talking about something that today is this way. The future, it's something else. Yesterday, well, <laughs> who knows? It, it was something. Um, before I go too far here, I want to apologize for one thing. I was intending to take this, yes, PowerPoint, presentation and spice it up with a lot of little extras and things like that, but my last few weeks have been a little hectic, and uh, so you're getting it in the raw form, but that's okay, it's all there. Okay, what is digital? I mean, we keep throwing this, this term digital around. Um, it's one of those things that we all know intrinsically what it means, but we don't think about it on a day-to-day -day basis. Digital is simply the transmission of analog information, sight and sound, via a digital means, digitizing it, meaning turning it into packets of digits and then reconverting it to analog so that we can use it. I mean, there, I, I don't think there's anybody here who has the ability to look at a, a digital source, like in the matrix, we see all the stuff running in front of you and you can actually figure out what's going on from that. Well, I can't. I don't know anybody else who can. So we're in the situation where basically digital is a transportation medium only. Keep that in mind. It's a transportation medium only because you're putting into it Maybe a stored digital, maybe an analog, a microphone, but it's going through this digital transformation and then coming out on the other end, somehow or another, as an analog. So digital is not what we are actually using. It is the means we have of getting it from here to there. Um, digital has certain advantages and certain disadvantages. The advantages is that once it's been transferred into that digital state, um, it's relatively immune to a lot of uh, outside interference, unlike analog, because the world is analog. And the 
analog world can interfere with itself very easily. Digital, on the other hand, it kind of knows what it's looking at. This packet checks that packet. They make sure that both packets are OK, and everything goes back and forth. Digital has the advantage of, of a clearer transmission. Disadvantages, you have to convert things from analog to digital, and then you have to convert them from digital back to analog. That gives you room for error. It's not a big deal, but it is something that we all need to consider. Digital can cause its own errors sometimes. OK, timing is everything. How many of you have taken, oh, say, an Extron workshop on a digital transmission? Anybody in here? Good. You know what I'm talking about here when we talk about timing. Timing on digital is critical. I mean, we've all had the experience with either analog or digital, doesn't matter, of watching a movie and seeing somebody's lips moving a second or two after whatever they've said comes out, or vice versa, you know, starting to talk before their lips start to move. Um, that's a timing issue that we can see. Timing issues in digital make a lot more uh, trouble sometimes because a timing issue can do things like shifting your colors. Uh, it can shift the registration of the whole thing. Um, but timing also is where all of these things are placed. All digital signals that we're using today fall under certain visa um, regulations, ANSI regs, visa regs, and they have things in them like EDID, HDCP, you know a lot more about that, and audio. EDID. EDID is Extended Display Information Data. What it means is when the signal goes from whatever your source is, let's say it's a computer, whatever your source is, it has to go to the device, in this case, for example, a projector. The projector has to be recognized by the source, and that's the EDID. It has to be recognized by the source and says, OK, I need to send this information out in a method, in a mode that this can recognize and use effectively. Or this unit has to say, change it to this. It's a handshaking type of thing that happens. Um, it has its own kind of problems because there's a lot of different types of projectors, a lot of different types of devices out there. EDID is going to be replaced fairly soon. Um, in fact, it's already kind of on its way with, um, yeah, I'm trying to remember it here. Yeah, display ID. What's the difference between EDID and display ID? One big one. EDID goes out and tries to copy off the machine what it is that it's talking to. Display ID has a list of every type of display imaginable. And it compares it against that and says, oh, OK, this is a 1033 or a 1056 or whatever it happens to be. Display ID also contains one more register of devices. And those are our 3D devices. So it actually can communicate with a 3D device which the original EDID had no provisions for. So it gives you a, a, you know, a bigger thing. And you're going to see that just kind of easing in, because it's not a huge thing. HDCP, <laughs> high bandwidth digital content protection is the word that isn't in there. Um, we've talked about this in copyright. We talked about this in a lot of different things. It basically means you have to have um, you have to have a recognized uh, ability for you to display whatever it is you're supposed to display. Where does that come into play? Anybody want to tell me the, the biggest single area that that comes into play? Nope. Blu-ray. You got it. Blu-ray is the single biggest one. Yeah, it, it, it absolutely causes you problems with multiple displays. But it really is in anything that's coming through from a Blu-ray. How many of you use Blu-rays day to day in your classrooms? A few. How many of you use pre-recorded Blu-ray discs in your classrooms? Yeah, see, a few. But 
thing is, it is a percentage, a fairly small percentage of what's done on a day-to-day -day basis. Now, because it's in there, it has to be um, a part of the process of taking your digital signal and setting it up and sending it out to a device. So it's something we have to recognize. Um, we talk about keys with digital, with HTCP. Each device has a key. That key is transmitted from the unit back to your computer and they handshake back and forth and they say, okay, I know this computer, I know this projector, we'll do business together, bang, they're all set to go. That becomes important a little bit later um, because that can cause some time delays in the whole thing. Audio. Audio to me is one of the most frustrating parts of the entire digital proceedings. The reason for that is, um, take for example your typical HDMI cable. Your HDMI cable contains all of your video, all of your control signals, it has things like CEC, consumer you know, IDs and that kind of stuff, and it has your audio. Well, here's your problem. Let's take a HDMI cable, stick it in here, and stick it in your projector. Where's your audio? It's at the projector. <laughs> Where do you need it? You need it in the speakers. So there are some companies, Extron is one, that are now making things called de-embedders, audio de-embedders. It means that basically you can take the audio out of the digital stream, turn it into an analog, before you ever ship the digital stream out. And that can be very handy because in most cases, in our situation anyway, we're containing everything, say, in a lectern. And in that lectern is um, all of your you know, uh, computing and this kind of stuff, but that's also where your amplifiers are. And that's where everything goes up to the speakers. By stripping it off there, before we send it out to the speaker, or before we send it up to the projector, we're in better shape. Um, so audio is one of those variables you have to keep in mind. Okay, getting a little bit into the design theory here. Standalone versus distributed. We have a large number of classrooms on my campus. I, I maintain somewhere around 300 rooms. Um, we have a large number that are classrooms. That's it. They're, you know, classroom uh, 150 rider or whatever it happens to be. They aren't connected to anything except uh, through, um, you know, standard computer links, that kind of stuff, with one exception. I'll get to that in a second. Um, they stand alone. There's no connection between that room and another room intrinsically. The rooms are individual entities. We have very few rooms where things are distributed from one room to another or from this room to that room or from some other source to a distributed room. Um, it complicates it tremendously to go to a distributed model. The standalone classroom singular is the simplest and easiest tool you can have in your arsenal. Obviously, you'll have more. Uh, that will be of another type. I'll get into those in a second. The interconnected divisible rooms are some of the harder ones to work with. Any of you have classrooms that are divisible by walls? Oh, yeah. And you, I, you probably have a pretty good idea of how hard it is to get a switching system that works just when you open the walls. Well, you don't have to have, tell somebody, oh, well, you have to do this and then plug that and replug this. You don't want to do that. We are talking about faculty here. So um, divisible rooms are very difficult. Okay, controlled versus switched. Simple thing, but a real showstopper in a lot of digital uh, talks. If you have a controlled signal, that means your digital signal is going into a controller of some type. Be it a, um, uh, a good example is the uh, Crestron DM systems. They're, they're really great, but it allows you to control the signal, allows you to uh, transport it to different places simultaneously. It allows you to have other types of controls integrate in with other things, as opposed to switched. Switch is simple. That's a switcher. It looks like a projector, but it's actually a switcher. It has the ability to switch 
any of the inputs. That's the simplest switcher you can get, and that's the one that everybody has in the classroom and many times wants to forget about because, oh, it's more complicated if you run more cables. Well, not necessarily. You, so your typical classroom technology is this simple. You got a source, you got a signal, you got a display. I don't care what the source is. It could be a, a computer, could be a laptop, could be a VHS, could be a DVD, could be a uh, document camera, but it's a source. That signal then goes up to your display, be it a flat panel or a projector. Your moderate one, you have more sources, more likely you have more displays. We have a number of classrooms that have multiple displays in them. Sometimes they're set up for, for example, side-by-side -side presentation with two different images simultaneously. Most often they're set up for simultaneous display all the way through. Um, a little more complicated because you have more display units. And then your complex. Your complex is your integrated room where you're not only going to be teaching in it, but you're also probably going to ha be having conferencing. You may be having um, recording for uh, um, Blackboard. You may be having, uh, oh goodness, any one of a dozen different types of things going on. So the room is much more complica complicated. Um, those rooms you really need to set aside as a digital source because they are going to be complex, they are going to cost money, they are going to be much more complex. But the first one and the second one are not hard to do with digital if you take the right approach. One thing about digital signal characteristics, in, in analog, if you think about analog transmission, you're always trying to get the signal strength up to the point where it can run through all of these cables and be usable when it gets to the other end. With digital, it's just, just the other way around. You have the signal strength here. When it gets to the other end, whatever's left, the digital re-enhances. So in other words, it's pulling the signal together at this end as opposed to pushing it from this end. What does that mean in practical terms? In practical terms, what it means is if the signal is sufficient when it gets to the end, you can use it. If it is insufficient, even in a tiny amount, you get nothing. It's an either or situation. There's no such thing as weak digital signals. Um, you get to the point where the digital is starting to show just a little bit of flickering or something like that, and next thing you know, gone. It's on or off. Gee, on or off. Where did I hear that with digital before? Um, <laughs> but that's a whole other thing. The, so when you're designing digital, one of the biggest things you have to design, and I'll talk about it in a minute, is cable length. The length of, of cable runs that you go from one place to another. Okay, connector roulette, we all are dealing with this. DVI, HDMI, display port, all their offsprings, the mini display port, the mini HDMI. Um, I see people using uh, USB ports. Uh, I see them using DVI, and of course the DVI-A, DVI-D, you know, all of these different things. What are your faculty using? Do they know? Do they care? Probably not. They're using whatever plug works for them. Uh, when they come up to a lectern or come up to a desk, they want something that fits into their unit. On our campus, we have had to train faculty uh, to accept the term dongle and to realize that if they don't have the right dongle, they know who they can go to to get the right dongle so that they basically can take their iPad or whatever it is they happen to have and be able to plug it into our systems. Um, connector soup is one of the hardest things that you have to deal with with a lot of faculty. It would be wonderful if there was one connector that could do it all. Um, someday there may be, but as I said very early on, this is an immature technology. We have not seen the last of this. This is not something that um, is going to be unchanging from now till the time you folks retire. Uh, certainly not from the time I retire. And uh, I think what you're going to find is that the technology will keep changing, keep evolving, and you're going to find it, as Mark said, getting simpler as it goes along. What's the biggest complaint people have about HDMI at this mo moment in time? Anybody? 
Hmm? You got it in one, non-locking. One of the biggest problems people have is the bloody HDMI cable fell out again. And when it falls out, well, it's not just a matter of necessarily just sticking it back in. Sometimes you have to go through, jump through hoops to make it work. Um, Extron has a wonderful little gadget that can attach an HDMI permanently, which is great for switches and projectors and that kind of stuff, but you don't use it on a laptop. So all kinds of fun problems. DisplayPort was the answer to that, because it's a locking. Eh, we'll see. <laughs> OK. Um, each room that you deal in has an ex I'm assuming that it already has equipment in it. So it has existing paths from wherever your equipment end is, your teacher end, up to your projector, to your speakers, et cetera. And those can be you know, BNC5, VGA cables, very common. Uh, a, uh, AV, standard AV, coax, what have you. Audio, obviously all your audio cables. Uh, IP, you've got to have a network connection in there somewhere. And your speakers, speaker wires, that kind of stuff. Um, those already exist. What are they good for? Well, you're going to use them. They are still being used every day. Your analog speakers, your uh, AV, if you have uh, those connections, even if they're only used four or five times a year, it's valuable to have them so you don't touch those. What do you put in place? Well, one of the things you can do with your new digital paths that you're going to be integrating is you have a choice right off the bat of what you want to do for cabling. And this is basically the, the nexus of what I'm talking about. We had some decisions to make a few years ago as to how to bring HDMI, how to bring digital into the classrooms. Uh, there were a large number of faculty and administration who basically just wanted to ignore the problem. You know, ignore it and it'll go away type thing. Um, a number of us got together and said, you can't ignore this. It's going to be with us for a while now. We're going to have to do what we need to do because you know as well as I do that someday in the not too distant future, a faculty member is going to walk in with a laptop or a netbook or whatever it is that doesn't have an analog output on it. It only has, say, an HDMI or it only has um, a display port. What are you going to do? when that day comes. I said, well, we'll deal with it when it comes. Bad answer, very bad answer. We have gotta start early on and getting ready for this. We have known that digital is coming for a long time, folks. You know it better than they do, and we still haven't done that much. So what do we do? We can put in a DVI cable. What's there's two main problems with DVI cables. Actually, same problems actually with DVI, HDMI, and DisplayPort cables. Um, making them up in the field is miserable, if at all possible. Uh, I believe it was Greenlee just came out with an HDMI field kit where you can make HDMIs in the field. Um, anything that complex, it's really kind of tough. DVI connectors are big, very big. Try fitting a, a pre-made DVI cable through a, a one-inch conduit. Pretty much not going to go. Um, so making up those conduits in the field always introduces problems. And then you get your CAT cables. CAT5, CAT5E, CAT6, et cetera, et cetera. Those are small, lightweight cables, easily made up in the field, easily run, cheaply run as well. So if you go with CAT5 cables, as your digital source, you're fine because most manufacturers out there are now making some type of converters to go from HDMI, DisplayPort, whatever you want, DVI, down to a CAT5e cable or CAT5e or better, and then back converting at the other end so that you have a DVI or HDMI or DisplayPort out at the other end. If you're putting in standard cables, you can put in a standard CAT5e UTP. Who knows what UTP stands for? Unshielded, twisted pair, absolutely. The very best, most standard cable there is out there for most uses. For the type of thing that you're doing, if you're dealing less than 50, 60 feet between you and the, 
the projector, UTP is fine. UTP is what almost your entire network at a university is made up of. If you're going to be getting into a situation where you either are going to have a lot of interference, electrical interference, or you're going to have a lot of a lot longer run than you might otherwise have, you might want to look at the other two, FTP and STP. STP is not something you dump in your engine. Uh, STP is shielded twisted pair. FTP is foil twisted pair. What's the difference between the two? The foil twisted pair will take a tighter radius bend than the shielded twisted pair, so it's a little easier to use. Um, I know that a number of manufacturers recommend using some type of shielded twisted pair if you're going to be running distances of over 200 feet with their converters. Um, I have been running now up to 200 feet with UTP with no problems, and I'm using these things on a daily basis. So those really represent your salvation because let's find it. Face it, a Cat 5e cable with a little connector on the end that is locking is one of the simplest things out there. And people have been making these things up for years. We usually on our campus have a vendor come in and does all of our low voltage connections for uh, all our networking. Well, they're network cables. That's all they are. So if you run a few extra network cables that don't go back to any you know, box or, or, or um, you know, rack or anything, just run in the room, they know what to do. They're making them up. They're pulling them very easy. They don't take up a lot of <coughs> room in a conduit. You've got a pretty good um, bend radius on them, so they're pretty immune to a lot of outside interference. Field termination or not, I would say your field termination or your Cat 5e, no problem. I can do it. And I'm not an expert by any stretch of the imagination. Field termination of any of the others is A, problematical, B, difficult at best. Um, if you've ever looked at the inside of a DVI connector and thought about getting in there with a soldering iron to try to make that connection yourself, <clears throat> I hope your hands are a lot steadier than mine because that's one of the reasons that they don't do HDMI in the field because these connectors are so small and so fine that they have to be done by machine in a lab somewhere. And a uh, miserable problem. So, integrated versus parallel. Okay. Here's where we're talking some of the guts of the matter. A few years ago, there was a company that put out a <sighs> prospectus on where digital was going. And that company will remain nameless, but <clears throat> They scared a lot of people. They basically said, look, in, when, did, uh, when analog sunset comes along, all of your systems are going to be bogus, nothing's going to work, and you're going to have no way to transmit signals from your teacher to your projector. It's, it's over and done. And they <clears throat> put together a wonderful big integrated system. Uh, I, let's call it a digital media system. Um, <laughs> and it was great, and it took care of, it answered all of the questions except for two. One question was, how the heck do you afford it? <laughs> because if you're dealing with 300 rooms like I am, uh, and you're dealing with, my typical rooms cost between ten and $15,000 a room. Double that to go with a digital media system. Easily double that. But you can do so much more. Well, yes, but that's not what I need. I need to do something that the faculty need on a day-to-day -day basis in these rooms. There are some rooms, as I said before, some of these larger, more collaborative rooms, things that might have um, um, uh, distance communication or that kind of stuff built in. Great. That's where we're using these. But most of our rooms don't need the integrated approach, parallel approach. What's parallel? Parallel just means going up to your projector, you have multiple cables. You probably have multiple cables now. Well, you're adding one or maybe two, whatever it happens to amount to for your particular setup. So you're running everything over parallel systems and I know this is a, um, 
anathema for some people, the projector is now your switch. It's the projector that selects the, Im or you tell the projector to select a particular input. You're running parallel cables. Parallel means more cables, more fail points, absolutely, but less technology. The less technology in this case, one, saves a lot of money, two, means that it's much easier to service from the point of view of people coming in to try to make the thing run. What you have is you have your uh, computers. Two kinds of computers in many classrooms. One is the built-in. Faculty member comes in, sticks a USB thumb drive in the back of the thing or in your, in your front uh, um, um, yes, your USB port and they run their presentation. Second one is the guy comes in with his own laptop, iPad, netbook, um, pretty soon it will be iPhones, and plugs that in and makes it run. You gotta have all the provisions up there. If that means having uh, an HDMI connection or a DisplayPort connection or both, then basically you have all those connections up there. The built-in computer, on the other hand, can have its own port. Now, let's say you have a projector that has multiple HDMI inputs. You could have multiple cables running up, or you could add a simple HDMI um, uh, distribution amplifier to distribute to more than one, or you can have a simple HDMI switch, which basically allows you to switch between two, four different projector, uh, different input sources. Um, you buy the right ones, and they can get controlled by the same controller that you're doing the rest of the room with. It actually works pretty well. Uh, that's what I've been using in a couple of rooms. Uh, flat panel uh, projector, aspect ratio intelligence, that comes back to the HDCP. Um, you want the thing to basically be recognizable and have the right keys that all your digital equipment can run. When then you're using the computer in the room, that projector and that computer get to know each other intimately because they're always there. It becomes very quick for the two things to switch back and forth. I skipped over the DVD in a DVD VHS. We deal with it every day. Blu-ray. Blu-ray is the one big bugaboo. We use Blu-ray in less than a dozen rooms. Why is that? Those rooms are film study rooms. So they have the people who want to bring in things they have special considerations. Because when you hear about analog sunset, you're talking about Blu-ray. You're not talking about most of anything else. Analog sunset deals primarily with Blu-ray. Um, Extron has a wonderful white paper out called uh, Analog Sunset Demystified. Highly recommend. Go to their website, it's free, download it, look it over, it will really give you more information than any place I've found about a really good uh, description of what it actually is. So one of the things that they recommend and one of the things they, they mention is the fact that Analog Sunset deals almost exclusively with Blu-ray um, because it doesn't particularly forbid anything else. It deals with things that have an encryption via Blu-ray. So your DVD and even your VHS, I'll talk about that in a couple of days, uh, still work fine. They, they'll still uh, run with no problems. Flat panel displays. <sighs> Flat panel display works just like a projector. Um, the problem is if you get into a situation where you kind of have a lot of flat panel displays in a room, uh, multiples around for v different viewing, say in a collaborative room, it's a good way of doing it. Then you're starting to talk about management, and you're starting to talk about putting in one of those digital management systems so that you have the possibility of being able to display things, um, different things on more than one panel. If you're going to use one single uh, you know, panel in the front of a classroom for 12 people, no problem. Treat it like a projector. It gives you all the same things. Okay, the cost factor. I'm not sure how you guys run your uh, refreshing and upgrading situation, 
But with us, basically, we, we hit every room on campus at least once every four years, at least. At that time, we refresh the critical components, being the projector, uh, being uh, anything else that we feel has been there too long. Whenever we've done that for the last three years now, I have added into the vendor's RFP that they will run extra Cat 5e cables as a part of that upgrade. Even though they aren't touching anything else in the room except the projector and, and the um, a controller, they're running cables. Terminating them, leaving them untouched, just leave them there. Once those cables are in place, now you have a conduit to get from this place to this place. And you can use it for a lot of different things. Um, your older components, throw them away, get your new components, your new projectors. Obviously, that's a, that's a whole other issue. The last one is the key. And this is one of the places that I, I know I fall down, and I know that a lot of colleges and universities fall down. When you start talking about digital in a classroom, you're starting to talk about something that is going to require, I won't say more maintenance, but what it will require is more personnel time. You need to have people who can go out and assist the faculty with the problems that they're having. Most of them will be very simple. Most of them will be you know, um, simple training issues, but you have to have that. If you don't have enough personnel to be able to do this effectively, you're going to start disappointing people. Believe me, that's the last thing you want to do in this trade. I know. Mark's put that very well. <laughs> OK. The, rebuild, the other rebuild factors. Can the room take it? Is it a room that actually has the ability to put things in it from a wiring perspective? I have dealt with uh, rooms that are so old that the wiring is in um, wall-mounted raceways. Well, if, is it full? If it is, you may have to pull everything out and rewire from scratch. Cost factor. It's going to cost you a lot more to do that. On the other hand, most rooms can take it without too much trouble. Do you have the time? There's the rub. <laughs> because when we went from having people in our refresh cycle doing a simple thing like uh, changing out the projector and reprogramming the controller. Now we have them running cables. We used to be it would take them two and a half hours per room. Now it takes them a minimum of four hours per room. Okay, you're almost doubling what you're doing in there, which means you have to get the room offline for long enough, call it four hours, then you need a full day. Because after they've done the work, you've got to go in, verify, confirm the whole thing, check everything, make sure it functions under all known uh, circumstances. So it does take more time. It's best to be able to do it when the rooms are offline, if you ever have one of those times when the rooms are actually offline. But it becomes um, more time consuming. And what's your timetable? Most people here, I think, look at the summer as their best opportunity for being able to do upgrades, refreshes, this kind of stuff. Um, we recently had a situation where we did all of our refreshes during the summer, and now we're going into an upgrade. An upgrade in our particular case is taking out the existing computer and the desk and the wall rack worth of equipment, as I was telling the other day. Uh, we'll take that stuff out. We'll put everything in a lectern. If we put everything in a lectern, that's great. But boy, that takes a lot more time. For some reason or other, the powers that be have decided that that's now going to happen between now and summer. <laughs> um, in order to do that, we have gone to them and immediately told them we have to double the amount of money that you have um, set aside for this for vendors and, and personnel because they're going to be working nights and weekends. There's no other way to do it. Um, they seem to be okay with that. Not sure why, but <laughs> they did. So your timetable, if you can do this stuff in the summer, when you're basically going to have the rooms available to you on a more regular basis, it actually works pretty well. Now, if you're using your rooms all summer too, well, 
You have to work with your registrar. That's another issue. <laughs> okay, the faculty factor. Retraining. With a DM type system, there's a lot of retraining because usually you have to use a new patrol system. You have to have um, a new, many times, touch panel or something similar to that in there. That gets faculty uncomfortable. And when faculty are uncomfortable, things start to break down. And a lot of problems can happen that aren't your fault, but will become your fault. <laughs> we all know that one. Um, the new controls can be a headache. What we have done, our control model currently is not touch panels. Our control model currently is standard Extron uh, MLC 226 IPs. And basically, when we started doing digital, we took one of the blank buttons and put HDMI on it. And I'll tell you, that took three weeks to decide whether it was supposed to be digital or HDMI or... A lot of people want to do, well, okay, let's just put a two on it and put a two on the HDMI cable and, wow, well, great association. It doesn't work. <laughs> I mean, that's too simple for faculty. Faculty want something more complex. So we put HDMI and told them what it is. Um, why doesn't it do this? Oh, somebody was talking about that earlier, about the Star Trek concept of, wow, why doesn't, you know, I saw this done on Star Trek. Why can't I do it here in the classroom? Why can't I split this into four pieces and, and have this one here and that one? Um, the easiest answer is, it's not in the budget. I mean, anything's in the budget if you want to spend enough, but why doesn't it do what I expect it to do is a hard one. We'll do with that. Why so slow? This, this is the important one. When you're dealing with a parallel system, or what I also call a, a solo HDMI solution, you basically have a situation where if you're bringing a new laptop in or a new device of any kind and you plug it in, from the time you push the HDMI button for the projector to switch over to that new input, it takes a certain finite amount of seconds. Now, sometimes that can be seven to 10 seconds. For a faculty member, that is eternity. Well, what we have done is we put little signs up saying, it may take you with a new device 10 seconds, 15 seconds for this to switch. Don't call us until that 15 seconds has gone by. The other thing we do is we build into the program the fact that after they push the HDMI button, the whole panel is frozen for at least 30 seconds. They can't push something else. Uh, they can push all they want, but it won't do anything. Um, those two things have allowed us to do this, and we've had a remarkably few number of problems so far. I do say, however, that one of the reasons is that is we have a remarkably few number of people who are using HDMI. Um, it's gonna get more, we all know that, but right now I would say analog usage in our rooms is probably 95 plus percent. It's gonna change, we're trying to get it ready for the future, but for right now, the big question at the end the faculty member will say is, why? it's another cable, why do I need this? Tell them it's the government. They like that. <laughs> now, you tell them basically it's giving you more options because when you trade in your five-year-old laptop, which weighs 45 pounds, for an iPad, you're going to want to be able to do more with it. And when you want to do that, we'll be ready. Wow, we become the heroes. <laughs> okay. Conclusion. This is my take on this, please. Remember, I'm not an expert, nor do I play one on TV. I was, def I was given the, uh, whoop, that was me. Now, can you get me back there? Or at least get me started up again and I'll flip through. Boom. I must have hit it. Okay. Um, two paths are better than one. Parallel paths up to the projector are much more cost effective. And that's one of the most 
basic bottom lines I can come up with. It works. It doesn't produce more failure points. But it also makes it easier to trace your problems because you've got one factor, the projector, that's connecting the both of them. The Bureau of Redundancy Bureau, <laughs> one of my favorites. Bureau of Redundancy Bureau says if you've got two or more paths, you're better off because basically there's always a chance that the other one will work. So you, you want to have that. And when the person comes in with a um, good example, person comes in with an iPad, plugs it into the HDMI port, uh, doesn't work for whatever reason, doesn't seem to work to their satisfaction. Okay? They call the help desk. Help desk comes over. One of the things they carry with them is an iPad to VGA adapter. They say, okay, well, this doesn't work. I'll put in a note to get this fixed. And in the meantime, plug this in. Bang. They're going via the IGA, uh, VGA method up there. Faculty members happy. They get to, you know, do their presentation. They don't care whether it's digital or analog at that moment in time. All they want is they want the picture to show up. And that's what we're giving them with the redundancy. The dreaded digital sunset of our, our I should say analog sunset. Digital sunset's a whole other thing. Um, analog sunset, read that paper from Extron. You will find it demystifies the whole thing beautifully and it's not something to worry about, bottom line. Consumer-driven, that's the other thing. We're all aware of this. I mean, the iPad was not developed as an institutional device. It was developed for consumers. So much stuff today is developed for consumers. I think what you're going to find is you're going to need to do more looking at the trade magazines and more looking at eBay or at uh, Amazon. And basically what you need to do is see what's coming next. Look at the Nexus. There's a, a perfect example. Next, who knows? If I had one prediction, my prediction would be this. HDMI, DVI, DisplayPort, they'll all eventually go away. And they'll be replaced by something else. What will that be? My guess? Currently, I'd say a Cat 5e. A year from now, who knows what I'd say. Very well could be, absolutely. When they start making wireless power, I'll believe that everything else will go wireless. That's my bottom line. Thank you, folks.